off right here on VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower. And we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. On today's program, John Russell tells us about an interesting new statue in New York City. Jill Robbins answers a question from an English learner. We close with an American story. This week, it's Paul Bunyan. An American folktale, but first, American drug maker Pfizer says a smaller dose of its COVID-19 vaccine appears safe and 91% effective at preventing infections in five to 11-year-old children. The company released a study with the findings on Friday. The United States is considering whether to vaccinate children of that age. The usual dose of the vaccine, made by Pfizer and its German partner BioNTech, has already been approved for people ages 12 and older. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration (FDA) is studying the information. If the agency approves the smaller dose for children, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will decide who should receive them. The injections could be available in early November. More than 25,000 doctors and healthcare providers already have requested the vaccines. The administration of President Joe Biden has also paid for enough child-size doses for the nation's 28 million five to 11 year olds. The Pfizer study released Friday followed 2,268 children. They received two shots, three weeks apart, of either a placebo, an inactive substance. Or a smaller dose of the vaccine. The smaller dose was one third the amount given to people 12 and older. Researchers said the vaccine was nearly 91 percent effective. They found 16 COVID-19 cases among children receiving the placebo, and three cases in children who received the actual shots. There were no severe illnesses reported among any of the children, but the vaccinated children had weaker symptoms than the unvaccinated ones. In addition, young children given the smaller doses developed coronavirus-fighting antibody levels as strong as those found in teens and young adults who got the normal shots. Hospitalizations of mostly unvaccinated children reached record high levels last month in the U.S. The CDC reported earlier this week that Pfizer vaccinations were 93 percent effective at preventing hospitalizations among 12 to 18 year olds. New infections are being blamed on the highly infectious Delta variant spreading across the country. Pfizer's study of younger children found the shots to be safe, with similar or fewer side effects such as pain at the place of the injection and a temporary higher body temperature. Children have a lower risk of severe illness or death than older people. The American Academy of Pediatrics said nearly 6.2 million American children have been infected with the coronavirus. More than 1.1 million have been infected in the last six weeks. Drug maker Moderna is also studying its COVID-19 shot in younger children. In addition to that. Pfizer and Moderna are studying the shots in children as young as six months old. 
Results are expected later in the year. A large statue of a woman's head with her finger pressing on her lips now faces Lower Manhattan in New York City, inviting the busy area to stop and listen. The message of Barcelona based artist Jaume Plensa's work is to keep silent, to listen to the profound noise of the water talking to us, he said recently. He added, The water, when it moves, makes a special sound, very special. The statue, twenty four meters tall, is Plensa's biggest work to date. It is called Water's Soul. The statue's white head sits in front of tall buildings in Jersey City's Newport waterfront in New Jersey, facing the Hudson River. It stands directly across from Greenwich Village and about six kilometers from the Statue of Liberty. On a recent morning, Plensa saw the piece fully put together for the first time. Its call for silence competed with engine sounds and the cries and laughter of children. But those are not the kind of noises that Plensa says his artwork is targeting. I'm talking about the noise of information and messages to us, he said at New York's Gallery La Longue Company, where a public showing of new work will open on October 29th. Plensa, 66, was hired to create the piece about two years ago by Lafrac and Simon Property Group. The group has developed the area, including the place where Water's Soul stands. The statue shows a real-life person whose image was scanned. The piece was made from various materials at Plensa's Barcelona studio. It was shipped in 23 containers, each 12 meters long, to Jersey City to be put together. The sculpture is visible from far and wide. Some local people have watched the piece being put together since August. They wonder why the statue seems to tell people to be quiet, an act known as shushing. Why is she shushing? asked Cleveland Rice age 63. I'm sure there's got to be some kind of meaning behind it, said William Scherntube, age 53. Juan Yan, age 31, said, I'd say it's telling New York City to keep this area a secret because we don't want to drive more people to work here. Miriam, age 46, who did not give her last name, has a direct view of the statue from her apartment window. She does not like it. I don't find it fitting in the entire environment, she said. Plensa has been showing his work around the world for more than forty years. He said it can take time for his art to become accepted into different environments. In the public space, the piece is the piece, and it's competing with so many other objects, he said. Plensa said the sculpture is not sending a message to Manhattan, and she is not shushing, but silently calling for quiet. In many of my pieces, I'm asking the viewer, close your eyes and look inside yourself, because you have an amazing quantity of beauty hidden inside, he said. Water's soul can best be viewed from the river, he added. Like many of Plensa's works, including several new pieces at the Gallery Le Long show, Water's soul is the head of a woman with closed eyes. His pieces mostly show women, he says, because he sees life and the world as female, while boys are just an accident, a very nice accident, but an accident. I'm John Russell.
To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Hello. Today's question for Ask a Teacher comes from Ademir in Brazil. When can I use will with the same meaning of want? When are the two words interchangeable? Thanks. Dear Ademir, thank you for writing to us. It is easy to understand why you have this question. Merriam-Webster Learner's Dictionary uses want in one of the meanings it gives for will, saying it means to want or desire something. There are three different ways we use the verb will. Let us look at those one by one. First, you should understand that we have a special kind of verb called a modal verb. These helping verbs include can, could, shall, should, ought to, will, and would. When we use will in this way, it means that something is expected to happen. The train will leave at 9 o'clock. Second, when the verb stands alone, it means to want or desire something. Here is an example. You can say what you will, but my yellow car is beautiful to me. In that case, you may use the verb want and have the same meaning. You can say what you want, but my car is beautiful to me. The only difference here between will and want is that we often add to after want, as in, You can say what you want to about my car. I still love it. A third meaning of the verb will is to cause or try to cause something to happen by using the power of your mind. Here is an example. The student willed the clock to move faster toward the end of class. As in the earlier case, you might be able to use want in these sentences, but it would change the meaning a little and sound less forceful. Finally, we can use will to talk about leaving our property to others when we die. That is a legal term, as in, she willed the family jewels to her only child. In that case, you could not substitute want unless you added another verb, as in this example. She wanted to will the family jewels to her only child. I hope this makes the difference clear to you, Ademir. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Jill Robbins. We tell a traditional American story called a tall tale. A tall tale is a story about a person who is larger than life. The descriptions in the story are exaggerated, much greater than in real life. This makes the story funny. Long ago, the people who settled in undeveloped areas in America first told tall tales. After a hard day's work, people gathered to tell each other funny stories. Each group of workers had its own tall tale hero. Paul Bunyan was a hero of North America's lumberjacks, 
the workers who cut down trees. He was known for his strength, speed, and skill. Tradition says he cleared forests from the northeastern United States to the Pacific Ocean. Some people say Paul Bunyan was the creation of storytellers from the middle western Great Lakes area of the United States. Other people say the stories about him came from French Canada. Early in the 20th century, a writer prepared a collection of Paul Bunyan stories. They were included in a publication from the Red River Lumber Company in Minnesota. It is not known if the stories helped the company's sales, but they became extremely popular. Here is Shep O'Neill with our story about Paul Bunyan. Many years ago, Paul Bunyan was born in the northeastern American state of Maine. His mother and father were shocked when they first saw the boy. Paul was so large at birth that five large birds had to carry him to his parents. When the boy was only a few weeks old, he weighed more than 45 kilograms. As a child, Paul was always hungry. His parents needed ten cows to supply milk for his meals. Before long, he ate fifty eggs and ten containers of potatoes every day. Young Paul grew so big that his parents did not know what to do with him. Once, Paul rolled over so much in his sleep that he caused an earthquake. This angered people in the town where his parents lived, so the government told his mother and father they would have to move him somewhere else. Paul's father built a wooden cradle, a traditional bed for a baby. His parents put the cradle in waters along the coast of Maine. However, Every time Paul rolled over, huge waves covered all the coastal towns. So his parents brought their son back on land. They took him into the woods. This is where he grew up. As a boy, Paul helped his father cut down trees. Paul had the strength of many men. He also was extremely fast. He could turn off a light and then jump into his bed before the room got dark. Maine is very cold for much of the year. One day, it started to snow. The snow covered Paul's home and a nearby forest. However, this snow was very unusual. It was blue. The blue snow kept falling until the forest was covered. Paul put on his snowshoes and went out to see the unusual sight. As he walked, Paul discovered an animal stuck in the snow. It was a baby ox. Paul decided to take the ox home with him. He put the animal near the fireplace. After the ox got warmer, his hair remained blue. Paul decided to keep the blue ox and named him Babe. Babe grew very quickly. One night, Paul left him in a small building with the other animals. The next morning, the barn was gone, and so was Babe. Paul searched everywhere for the animal. He found Babe calmly eating grass in a valley with the barn still on top of his back. Babe followed Paul and grew larger every day. Every time Paul looked, Babe seemed to grow taller. 
In those days, much of North America was filled with thick green forests. Paul Bunyan could clear large wooded areas with a single stroke of his large, sharp axe. Paul taught Babe to help with his work. Babe was very useful. For example, Paul had trouble removing trees along a road that was not straight. He decided to tie one end of the road to what remained of a tree in the ground. Paul tied the other end to Babe. Babe dug his feet in the ground and pulled with all his strength until the road became straight. In time, Paul and Babe the Blue Ox left Maine and moved west to look for work in other forests. Along the way, Paul dug out the Great Lakes to provide drinking water for Babe. They settled in a camp near the Onion River in the state of Minnesota. Paul's camp was the largest in the country. The camp was so large that a man had to have one week's supply of food when walking from one side of the camp to the other. Paul decided to get other lumberjacks to help with the work. His work crew became known as the Seven Axe Men. Each man was more than two meters tall and weighed more than 160 kilograms. All of the axemen were named Elmer. That way, they all came running whenever Paul called them. The man who cooked for the group was named Sourdough Sam. He made everything except coffee from sourdough, a substance used in making sourdough bread. Every Sunday, Paul and his crew ate hotcakes... Each hot cake was so large that it took five men to eat one. Paul usually had ten or more hot cakes, depending on how hungry he was. The table where the men ate was so long that a server usually drove to one end of the table and stayed the night. The server drove back in the morning with a fresh load of food. Paul needed someone to help with the camp's finances. He gave the job to a man named Johnny Inkslinger. Johnny kept records of everything, including wages and the cost of feeding Babe. He sometimes used nine containers of writing fluid a day to keep such detailed records. The camp also was home to sport the reversible dog. One of the workers accidentally cut Sport in two. The man hurried to put the dog back together, but made a mistake. He bent the animal's back the wrong way. However, that was not a problem for Sport. He learned to run on his front legs until he was tired. Then he turned the other way, and ran on his back legs. Big mosquitoes were a problem at the camp. The men attacked the insects with their axes and long sticks. Before long, the men put barriers around their living space. Then, Paul ordered them to get big bees to destroy the mosquitoes. But the bees married the mosquitoes, and the problem got worse. They began to produce young insects. One day, the insects' love of sweets caused them to attack a ship that was bringing sugar to the camp. At last, the mosquitoes and bees were defeated. 
They ate so much sugar, they could not move. Paul always gave Babe the blue ox a 35-kilogram piece of sugar when he was good, but sometimes Babe liked to play tricks. At night, Babe would make noises and hit the ground with his feet. The men at the camp would run out of the buildings where they slept, thinking it was an earthquake. When winter came, Babe had trouble finding enough food to eat. Snow covered everything. Ole, the blacksmith, solved the problem. He made huge green sunglasses for Babe. When Babe wore the sunglasses, he thought the snow was grass. Before long, Babe was strong and healthy again. One year, Paul's camp was especially cold. It was so cold that the men let their facial hair grow very long. When the men spoke, their words froze in the air. Everything they said remained frozen all winter long and did not melt until spring. Paul Bunyan and Babe left their mark on many areas. Some people say they were responsible for creating Puget Sound in the western state of Washington. Others say Paul Bunyan and Babe cleared the trees from the states of North Dakota and South Dakota. They prepared this area for farming. Babe the Blue Ox died in South Dakota. One story says he ate too many hotcakes. Paul buried his old friend there. Today, the burial place is known as the Black Hills. Whatever happened to Paul Bunyan, there are lots of stories. Some people say he was last seen in Alaska, or even the Arctic Circle. Another tradition says he still returns to Minnesota every summer. It says Paul moves in and out of the woods, so few people ever know that he is there. <laughs>